Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship, and we're remembering veterans today. And so if you are a veteran, we invite you to stand. And Andrea has a uh, prelude that is patriotic. So please stand if you are a veteran in the service in any branch. they've done for our country. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Well, apparently my battery was dead, but that's why you come to worship, isn't it? Because you might have had a long week and your battery's feeling kind of low, and so you get recharged, and Ralph has just put in the battery, so now my microphone's going to work. Let us stand as we begin our worship today with Dane Marcy as our liturgist. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. From our homes and our workplaces, from our school and our play spaces, we have been called. Called together to worship and refreshing. God of grace, in this time of music and prayer and reflection, open our hearts, minds, and souls to feel your spirit blowing through our lives. As we sing, And when our time together concludes, send us back out, ready to take the risks that come with using all the gifts we have been given to their full potential. Please join me in singing the opening hymn, number 480, Open My Eyes That I May See.
remain standing, if you don't mind, and join me in the unison of prayer and assurance of grace. Gracious God, the circle of your love and community is wider than we can imagine. For those of your love and community, is always Please be seated. God calls us to a new life. God calls us to a new way. When we stay from the path, God calls us back. Not with judgment, but with forgiveness. We are forgiven people. Right, this week's announcement. The newsletter deadline is this Thursday, November 16th at 9 a.m. If you have anything to submit, please do so before that time. The 175th Church Anniversary Committee meeting will be held at 6 p.m. in Heritage Hall this Wednesday, November 15th. The Stewardship Committee are meeting in the meeting room next to that kitchen. We can always use liturgists. Now I will say, I just checked, there's only two more dates left this year, December 17th and 31st. So it is becoming very popular. So if you wanna be part of the popular kids, those two dates are ready and available for you to sign up over there on by next to the soundboard. Uh, next Sunday is going to be Youth Sunday. So plan to be in church for an extra special service led by the youth. And then there is also a Goodfellows insert in your bulletin. So the um, holiday season is upon us, specifically Christmas. And if you know someone who is in need, um, fill out this uh, bulletin here, or excuse me, fill out this form. And it's got directions on there where you can send it. Are there any other announcements that I have missed or anyone would like to share? Are there any guests today that you would like to point out? Aaron, stand up. I'm going to bring him a microphone, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, yep. Uh, this is uh, just came here. Uh, my uh, mother uh, attended here when she was young, and uh, I did for a little while. And just thought I'd come back and uh, check it out. Um, my name's Eric. <laughs> and he gets a chocolate bar. <laughs> well, welcome back, Eric. Are there any joys and concerns of the church family today? Oh, she just ran away with the microphones. Hold on. <laughs> well, anyway, I can talk loud. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any anniversaries this month? All right. <laughs> year are we celebrating? 52. 52. All right. <laughs> all right.
all right this time on by the children to come and join me on the steps and while they're doing that i just want to call out a big shout out of thanks to all of you uh, we have raised money for 118 of those solar lights and there's still sticky notes up here if you didn't get a chance you can buy three lanterns at $30 or six lanterns at $60. So there's still a chance. And those solar lights will go to kids in the Ukraine so they don't have to be in the dark at night. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to see you this morning. Can anybody tell me what this long thing is? OK, it's called a level. Have you ever seen your mom or your dad use this at home? And tell me why they used it. To make it level. To make it level. Right. So if we were going to put up a shelf, right, and we didn't use this, and it was like this, what would happen to all the things on the shelf? They'd all fall off, wouldn't they? OK? So the secret of making sure something is level, can we all say that word? Level, level, is look in the center. What do you see right in here? A bubble. Excellent. And what does that mean with the bubbles right there in the center? Yes, it's straight. Yes. Why are there two tubes? I don't know, but I will find out. Get ready to answer that, David. OK, anyway, yes, there are two tubes. So you know what? Right now, your life is pretty easy, relatively speaking. You go to school, you stay home, you have playtime, you have some homework. You know, it's not too complicated, right? But as you get older, how many of you are in Scouts? Yeah, that fills up your time. Anybody in any kind of sports? OK, dance. Do you go to dance? Yes. Anything? What else do you do? Soccer. Soccer, of course. So as our lives get more and more busy, it's hard to keep that balance in our life, isn't it, to keep our lives on track? Well, guess what? We have the easiest way to watch that bubble stay straight. What do you think that is? Well, how can we find balance in our life? What are you doing here this morning? Coming to church. If you keep God as center in your life, then those bubbles are going to be right there in the center. But when you allow all your activities, or all your other kind of stuff that you have to do, and you forget about God, what happens? Your life kind of gets a mess, kind of like all the stuff falling on the ground from the shelf that you were trying to put up, OK? So as we see this little bubble, you see the little bubble? Do you guys like blowing bubbles? Do you? I do, too. See that little bubble? That's our key to make sure that our life is level coming to Sunday school, coming to worship as these big boys and girls, they are saying they know their life needs God. Because without God in our life, we're unbalanced, aren't we? OK? Aren't we glad that God is in our life? Let's pray. Loving God, thank you so much for being the center in our life and help remind us with this level what happens to us when we get off course, when we forget to put you in our life. And coming to worship every Sunday is so important because that's the best way we can start each week by keeping you in the center, keeping you in focus. Thank you for levels and thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you for coming up and joining me today. And now I'm going to invite you to stand. Remember what we say? May the peace of Christ be with you. OK, let's all stand. And on the count of three, nice and loud, look straight out here. One, two, three. May the peace of Christ be with you. Oh, could you hear that? No. We got to try it one more time. May the peace of Christ be with you. One, two, three. May the peace of Christ be with you. 
One more time. I'm not. Joyce, did you hear that? Joyce did not. See the lady up there, the pretty lady there? You, we got to make sure she heard it, okay? Here we go. You can yell in church. It's okay. One, two, three. May the peace be with you. Did you hear that? She heard it. Now let's stand up and greet one another this morning. Thank you so much. By the way, did you all wave to the folks in the balcony so they don't feel lonely? Let's all wave. All right, good. And all the folks in the back, great. You know, we all need a level in our lives. I need the every hour is the hymn we're going to sing next. Truly, without Christ in our lives, we can do nothing. We do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So as we stand and sing, if we're able, let us remember that. I need you, God, every hour of my life. Let us sing.
and during this time of offering, just rem I'll just remind you that we have our candle station up here in the front. Somebody said to me recently they thought that was Catholic. I have been in many Protestant churches that have these wonderful little opportunities for us to come up and pray. So it's not strictly Catholic, it's all faiths. And um, there's a basket in the back, and if you would like to have a candle lit during this offertory time, uh, place a, a card back there and someone will go back and pick up the card and you don't have to write anything on it. It's just maybe you didn't want to feel comfortable coming up and lighting the candle yourself. Also, our bell banner is still here. It's from our All Saints Sunday. There still are some bells. If you'd like to hang a bell or pin a bell on our bell banner, it's in memory and rem remembrance of those that we have loved and lost. So we want to continue to remember that as well. You know, your offering last week empowered ministry within our congregation and responded to the needs of our community. It also supported the work of our United Church of Christ partners at work to relieve the suffering and devastation around this world. This important work happens thanks to the way the people of the United Church of Christ live and give connectionally. So this morning, as we give of our offerings, I invite you to give generously as we worship God through sharing our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
God of truth and light, we come to you from our daily lives that are full of scams and tricks, seeking to gain our confidence and steal and betray. In many ways, it makes us wary of opportunities to show compassion. Jesus has reminded us to trust in you and in your truth that speaks not through phones or emails, but directly to our hearts. As we give this morning, as you have called us, may we do so with joy, not fear. We pray this in the name of Christ, who intercedes for us that we might know truth. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we have been blessed with uh, uh, Becky Anderson, who um, voluntarily lines up special music for us. Becky's right here. If you ever get a chance, please say thank you to her for that. And this morning, she has lined up a trombone trio. And so I invite you to turn your attention now and enjoy this special music. Becky Anderson, Derek Johnson, and Jim Huckemeyer. Thank you very much. 
I suppose, Maddie, they're too old to be in your band, though, aren't they? They're in our community band. Oh, that's right. They're in the community band. You don't want to miss their next concert. You're never too old for band. Never, ever too old for band. <laughs> I didn't even coax her to say that. This morning, we have two scripture. The first one I will read from Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want from the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? This is God now speaking. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt Offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The second reading is going to be from Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, and it's the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look! Here is the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all those young women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for, uh, for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the young women came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Thank you, Dane. He's truly a seasoned reader. Thank you. This is the word of our living God. This is the word of our living God. Thanks be to God. Something has to change. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever felt that in your life? That things are just not working anymore? Or perhaps they never worked, but now you can see it. Or now you have the courage to name it. Maybe it's that the pulse of your marriage is weak and you're terrified you're about to lose it. Maybe it's that you rush to get your kids up for school and rush to make them breakfast and rush to get them to the bus and then rush to get them to soccer practice and rush to make dinner and rush them to bed. 
Maybe it's that paycheck you get for working long and hard hours is no longer as valuable as time spent with friends and family. Maybe it's that retirement is more boring and meaningless than you thought it would be. Or that retirement is no easier of a life, no less stressful than what preceded it. Something has to change. Often in our personal lives, we say that something has to change, but we also say the same regarding our nation. Something has to change when poll workers and election officials are slandered and stalked and fear for their safety and for the safety of their families when they strive to provide for a fair election. Something has to change when communities are split between Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter rallies and further anger and divide ensues. Something has to change when opiates, opioids addict and kill thousands of men and women and young adults every single year, destroying families while well, the pharmaceutical companies get rich. Something has to change when political debates, which once were intended to persuade, now seek to condemn and ridicule, further dividing us rather than uniting us. Something has to change when churches, malls, parks, and schools are not safe from gun violence and the country grieves the senseless deaths while doing nothing to prevent future gun violence. Something has to change. And then there is that parable. The ten bridesmaids take their lamps to meet the bridegroom. But five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Five took extra oil with them. The other five didn't. But the bridegroom was late, so all of them fell asleep because that's what people do when they are tired. But then at midnight, someone starts shouting that the bridegroom is arriving, and so everyone hurries to get their lamps ready. But what do you know? Five of them are out of oil, and five of them are not. Those that are out of oil go to some 24-hour 7-Eleven that just might sell them oil. But while they are gone, the bridegroom arrives. And when they return, they knock and say, Lord, Lord, open the door. But the bridegroom says to them, I do not know you. Now, I have to resist my immediate desire to dismiss this parable because of how uncomfortable it makes me feel. Because this story doesn't sound like Jesus to be slamming doors in people's faces who don't have enough. Doesn't scripture tell us to knock and the door will be opened? Ask and you shall receive. Those who are first will be last and the last shall be first. There are so many questions to ask. We could spend all day unpacking this particular parable. And often, the faithful reduce this parable to a simple statement that we all need to be ready for what may come our way. A call to be doomsday survivalists. 
But I fear such a simplistic interpretation of this parable misses the power of this message. For the question we really should be asking is not whether this is a parable about having enough oil, but whether it is a parable about trusting that the bridegroom will embrace us, whether we have oil or not. For do we really believe Jesus is suggesting that we should hoard what we have and be rewarded when we do not share with those that have none? Or might Jesus be suggesting that we should wait upon God with whatever we have or have not? As for me, I don't think this parable is really about being prepared and having enough oil. I think this parable is about being steadfast in our worship, whether we have oil or not. Five bridesmaids left to secure more oil when their oil ran out. They were fearful that the bridegroom would dismiss them if they greeted him with unlit lamps driven by their fear that what they had was not enough. They left and were nowhere to be found when the bridegroom eventually appeared. Could it be? Could it be that these foolish bridesmaids were left behind not because they ran out of oil, but because they had failed to remain steadfast in waiting for the bridegroom? Now, the five bridesmaids who had brought extra oil with them were also fearful. They also were concerned that the bridegroom would dismiss them if they greeted him with an unlit lamp. They were so fearful that they refused to share their oil with the other five. And this fear marks the wise five as no different than the foolish five. All were driven by fear. Could it also be that these five were invited into the wedding feast not because they had oil, oil that they refused to share, but because they remained steadfast in their wait for the bridegroom, whether they had oil or not? In our readings for this morning from Amos and Matthew, at first, all I heard was the anger in these texts, and it distracted me. It disturbed me. You see, somehow I got it in my mind that being angry was a bad thing, like the worst thing in the world was for someone to be angry, and that somehow being angry was not being a good Christian. Am I alone in feeling this way? Have you ever wondered about that? I remember years ago, I thought that Jesus was love and therefore Jesus could never be angry. And I hated that gospel story that Jesus turned the tables over in the temple. I didn't think Jesus could be like that. But now I get it. Jesus got angry. And the God Jesus represents gets angry too. God gets angry, and thank God for that. You know why? You know why? Because it means that God is alive, and that God cares, and that God cares about what happens here in this world, and that what we do in our daily lives matters to God. And so when you come across a passage in the Bible where God sounds angry, I encourage you not to immediately disregard it. Just slow down. Slow down. And listen. God, through the prophet Amos, is angry. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. 
Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harp. But, but, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So, of course, God is angry. The people come to worship. They sing songs, they make music, they present an offering to God, but justice and righteousness are not happening in the life around them. The people do all the right things in worship, but their daily lives are not characterized by justice and righteousness. So Amos asks, what good is worship if it's not going to change our lives? What good is worship if it's not going to change our neighbor's life? What good is worship if it does not involve justice and righteousness? What good are we to God and to one another if we do not seek justice and righteousness? Worship, Amos would say, worship is not worship if it does not change us, spur us into action, make us just uncomfortable enough to do something. And so just as we say, Amos also says this morning, something has to change. Many of us are desperate for change. Change in our personal lives. Change in our family lives. Change in our national life. If we hear the words of Jesus in the parable of the ten bridesmaids, then we will hear Jesus call us to be faithful, to be diligent, in our wait upon God. But the glorious good news is that God will greet us, embrace us, and invite us to the wedding party, whether we have oil or not. We just need to be consistent and faithful as we wait for God's invite. Our experience of God's grace is not dependent upon the strength of our intellect our passion, our abilities, or even our faithfulness in being loving to others. Our experience of God's grace is not dependent whether we have sufficient oil or not. Our reserves can be completely drained with nothing more to give. And God will still hold us tight and tell us that God loves us oil or not. Something does change when we experience God's unconditional grace and acceptance. Something inside of us changes. Yet almost as a contradiction, God through Amos tells us that worshiping and waiting upon God is not enough. That experiencing God's grace and acceptance, even when we have no oil reserves, when we feel that we have nothing left to give, God still expects. God still expects that we seek justice and righteousness. For worship, even faithful worship, is not worship when we do not seek justice and righteousness. Something has to change. And that change needs to begin with us. We need to speak out and defend the refugee when others are silent or even hostile. Prayer is not enough. Do we not recall that Jesus and his family were once refugees 
in need of support. We need to offer safe shelter when domestic violence threatens families in our communities. We need to provide food and clothing to the needy when governmental programs are not enough. Not everyone has the means to care for themselves. We need to respectfully listen and seek to understand when others speak strongly and loudly in defense of ideas that we oppose. And then we need to respond to our opponents who are likely our neighbors and our family who just might be sitting alongside us at the Thanksgiving table. We need to respond just as strongly but less loudly and less personally so that we can once again seek to persuade and not to seek to condemn. Folks, prayer is not enough when political and social discord divides us. We need to fight for affordable and accessible health care for all people, regardless of their income and employment status. For why? Why should health care for all be any less essential than a military defense for all? Something has to change. And that change needs to begin with us. Not with our families, not with our neighbors, not even with those who oppose our beliefs. Just and righteous change needs to begin with us. If we find ourselves feeling like the one whose life has run out of oil, remember to wait in the darkness. Don't run from it. It is a holy place and God will meet us there. If we find ourselves feeling like we have more oil than those around us, remember to share what we have, even if it scares us. Don't trade temporary comfort for lasting and beloved community. The act of giving of ourselves creates a holy place and God will meet us there. And if we feel this world is out of control, that there's too much hurt and violence, too many broken families and shattered dreams, and we say to ourselves that something has to change, remember, that dedication to God is empty. It is empty unless we also seek to do justice and righteousness. For doing acts of justice and righteousness also create a holy place and God will meet us there. Gun violence, drug addiction, broken families, economic strife, debilitating illnesses, all of these need to stop. Even if we find ourselves comforted in God's arms, change will only occur when we, when we feel the anger and we seek justice and righteousness. Something in our personal lives and in our world has to change. And prayers are not enough. Too many suffer when we currently have the power to stop it. May God give us the wisdom and the courage and the anger to be the first to start. Amen.
found in your bulletin. We will take risks with what we have been given. We will explore the talents we have to share. We will use what we have to the best of our ability. We will be accountable for our choices. We will make a difference in the world. Go with God, who will help you do all these things. Amen. Oh, <laughs> my